Hello, good morning. Hello. Um, welcome to week three of Revelation Bible Study, a message of hope. Um, if you see me with an AirPod in one ear, that's because this is where the audio is getting recorded. Um, I didn't forget about it. It's on purpose. Uh, we're going to do a bit of the first chunk of Revelation today. So today's, again, going to be a day where we spend time thinking about the world behind the text and the world of the text. And then next week is our final session. We don't have nearly as much to read, and we'll be thinking about the world in front of the text a little bit more. So we'll get into that. Uh, but again, we'll do a quick review of the last two weeks uh, content. We'll read through Revelation chapters 4 through 11. And again, pausing whenever anything comes up. And then I'm going to turn to you at the end and ask, what do you really want to cover? And what do you really want to address in our final session? Because there's a lot out there in the world right now about this book of Revelation. And this can be a time and a place to sort of engage some of those things. So now that we will have read the entire book, what comes up? What questions do you have? Um, and how can we address it? And then this is on purpose that we're talking about this today to give me a little bit of time to like go and find some resources that might be helpful and things like that. Okay. And for you all to get thinking about sort of what questions you might, you might have again. So the world behind the text, the world of the text and the world in front of the text, this has really been grounding us as we've gone through uh, this study. The world behind the text is what's going on at the time that this book was written. Uh, in the communities for which this book was written and out of which this book came. So uh, Roman Empire is the, big, is the big thing here. The world of the text, this is the kinds of, of really rich imagery and very vivid uh, descriptive metaphors and images that come up out of the text. Um, one of the resources I was looking at this last week uh, talked about it as John is getting taken on two different nature hikes. One of them is horrifying, and the other one is really lovely. So the horrifying one, right, is the one that we spent time last week with. And then the really, really lovely one is this New Jerusalem, uh, chapters 21 and 22. Um, and then the world in front of the text, that's how the text is interpreted, and that's how the text is applied in our world today and throughout history also. So we're sticking with the world behind the text here and the world of the text again today. Here's Roman Empire. Um, this is again that timeline that I've cited a couple times just to connect uh, Roman Empire, uh, Roman emperors and what's going on in Jewish and Christian communities with the great fire of Rome and the Judean revolt with the destruction of the temple in 70 under Emperor Vespasian. Um, the Arch of Titus comes at the end of the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple where uh, the soon-to-be Emperor Titus comes back and celebrates his military victory. Now, again, we have this apotheosis and the wings of the eagle are going to come up later. So this is, again, this is Titus apotheosis becoming a worshiping uh, figure to be worshiped, becoming a god, and is riding on the wings, hint, hint, of an eagle. We'll get there. So last week we spent time with the dragon and the beast, uh, starting with the woman and the dragon, that strange little story in the middle of, like, uh, it, it, when you put it together with what we're reading today, it's really like, where did this come from? <laughs> it's just kind of plopped in the middle. Uh, and then we had the beasts. Um, we had these seven bull plagues and the connection to the M, uh, the Exodus, uh, with the seven plagues connecting to the ten plagues in Egypt. Uh, and then we had the two city motif, the city of Babylon as the city you don't want to be a part of, and the city of New Jerusalem as the good city that you do want to be a part of. And that that is personified as a whore and as a bride. Uh, following that, destruction and fall of Babylon. And then 
the beast is defeated and then finally the dragon is defeated and there's the last judgment but this is not the end of the book there are two more chapters uh revelation 21 and 22 right so even though this can all feel like very climactic the climax of the book the main point that we're driving toward is that new jerusalem vision so today we're looking at revelation chapters 4 through 11 a little bit simpler than last time because last time we were all over the board just all these different things we're a little bit more focused today we have seven seals and then we have seven trumpets and again we're going to get within these seven seals and trumpets we're going to get kind of scary cataclysmic plague type energy which really hammers home the focus on uh exodus connections that the way that uh the world was for Christians as it was, was not it. And so there's these connections to Exodus to bring hope to the people. So go ahead and open your Bibles to chapter four, Revelation chapter four. And we'll read together. Um, I'll read up front. Uh, the next chapter, chapter five, Let's read at our tables, but chapter four, we'll read together. After this, I looked and there in heaven, a door stood open. So this is the beginning of John's vision. Okay. The first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what will take place after this. What must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there in heaven stood a throne with one seated at the throne. And the one seated there looks like Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. Around the throne are 24 thrones and seated on the thrones are 24 elders dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. Coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And in front of the throne burn seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne, there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal. Quick pause. What is this reminding you of? Does this remind you of anything? Toward the end of the book of Revelation, maybe. Something like the New Jerusalem. We have all this crystal. We have all these emeralds, jasper, um, all these kinds of things. So around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. Mm. Let's pause there. Let's pause there. <laughs> when you, uh, do, do any of you have like little footnotes about eyes? Anything here? Or any ideas why we might be talking about so many eyes? I mean, we're talking, this is the beginning of the vision too. So there's lots of, you know, we're seeing a lot of things and it connects back to the Ezekiel vision of the wheel with millions of eyes or whatever. Um, okay, let's keep going because we'll have plenty of eyes to ponder in the coming verses. The first living creature, I'm at verse seven, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox the third living creature with a face like a human face, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and inside. Day and night, without ceasing, they sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creature living creatures, give glory and honor and thanks to the one who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall before the one who is seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, singing, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. All right, pause. There might be some familiar things in there, right? We've got uh, glory and honor and power. 
uh, you are worthy. These are things that we do. Um, we sing often in the. Yeah. Okay. So the there's so many hymns. There really are so many hymns um, that use a lot of these uh, lyrics. Uh, these this text as lyrics. Anything else you're noticing before we move on? What is the sevenfold spirit or the seven spirits of God? This keeps coming up. Mm. What are the seven spirits? Yeah. There's a there's a lot of numerology happening too, or like number connections. Oh, real quick, one thing. Um, if you've got, we're trying to do more uh, audio connection. So the airport is one of those things. And then the other thing is we'll pass a microphone around uh, so that people online can catch what's being said just because I often forget to repeat it. And then when we go back and watch it, it's like, I don't know what we're talking about. So um, there's a lot that uh, some is a very holy number. So connecting it to... Um, I don't have a great answer, but it's a good question to go forward with thinking about. Mm. Mm -hmm. That uh, seven symbolizes fullness, completeness, perfection. Thank you. Call me out. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to chapter five. Um, and go from verses one through 14. This will be the slain and living lamb. Uh, pick a person at your table to read, or you can share reading, but we'll kind of have a moment where we, there's a lot more noise in the space. So go ahead and read this part on your own. I can start. Yes. <laughs> that I saw in the right hand the on the throat. Okie dokie. I think we've all gotten to the end, so let's come back together. And I'm curious, it sounds like uh, there's a lot of like connections being made, things being drawn together. Uh, I'm wondering if in our conversations, if something has come up that you think might be interesting to the whole group, anybody have anything? If you do, go ahead, raise your hand, and then we'll get you a microphone. <laughs> You're not? Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyone? Bueller? No? Okay. I heard a couple things about numbers again, and I found something in this. Uh, my version is the New Revised Standard Version, but it's the Jewish annotated New Testament. So it's a lot of Jewish authors who are writing um, to help understand uh, more from like a Jewish perspective where some of these things are coming from. And so there's a whole like section on the numerology in Revelation. And I'd just like to read a little bit of this for you. Uh, maybe this c might help. Um, so it says, in antiquity, certain numbers implied perfection in the cosmos or in experience, and different cultures entertained different assortments of such perfect numbers. The Torah, or the first five books of the Bible, offers different types of numerological perfection in the number seven. So Genesis 2, 1 through 3, 7, uh, and other spots. And there's also a numerolo numerological perfection in the number 12, thinking about the 12 tribes of Judah. And four signified, as in most cultures, the four cardinal directions. But 40 also conveyed an enormous but a limited period. So the 40 years in the desert, 40 days of um, temptation, right? Those sorts of things. So Revelation is especially interested in the number seven. The main sevenfold entities consist of temple materials at the very beginning of the book that we'll see next week. Angelic servants of the heavenly temple, I mean, also horns, and here we had other seven eyes and things like that. And the number of seals on the mysterious scroll of judgment. Through numerology, the nature of the congregations uh, becomes an intrinsic extension of the perfect order of the heavenly world. So this is also being written to seven different churches. So there's a lot of like ideas of perfection that's coming in just through this number seven. We're talking about this, this scroll is perfectly sealed. This letter is perfectly being sent to churches. Um, the lamb with seven horns and seven eyes is perfect in many ways. Um, and then you have a little bit farther on, 
Um, so there's one scroll with seven seals. Is that correct? Yes, one scroll with seven seals. So the, the, there are seven churches that this is this book is being written to. Um, that wasn't great to mention here because we haven't gotten there yet, but we'll get there next week. Um, Revelation also offers three forms of negative, quote, quote, negative numerology. The period designated as a rampage of the nations and activity in, of the two martyrs uh, that we'll see in chapter 11 is limited to 42 months, which is half of seven years. So when we get there, we'll read about three and a half years, like all this stuff happens with three and a half years. It's a cutting in half of the number seven which is an indication of incompleteness or imperfection and the association of the dragon and the beast with the seven and 10. So seven uh, heads, 10 horns may indicate these creatures pretenses to holiness, claiming holiness, but actually not being so, right? On the other hand, then the number of the beast, 666, is merely the calculation of numerical equivalents of the Hebrew letters that would spell Nero Caesar. We came across this last week. This calculation reflects an ancient Jewish practice called gematria or gematria, uh, exploring the mysteries of words through their corresponding numbers. So that's a little bit more on this, all this number seven, definitely gives you a interesting image of a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes but um what else comes up in this uh chapter five we have one scroll with seven seals we have a lamb but also we have a lion see the lion of the tribe of judah this is uh verse five one of the elders said to me do not weep see the lion of the tribe of judah the root of david has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And then right after that, there is no lion because then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So again, all this perfection around this lamb and the, the spirit of God. How do they know it's the lion that turned into the lamb? Well, Let's go um, into a couple things about lions and how do I escape this like this? Okay. Lions and stuff, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. So I'm going to a website called the Blue Letter Bible. This is what I use sometimes when I get into uh, Greek parsing and nerd moments. And you're gonna join me whether you signed up for this or not. Uh, because this word conquered is really helpful to look at and think about. Uh, and it gets us into this conversation about the lion and about really what the lamb signifies. Because it's very, very intentional. It's not just, you know, Jesus was a shepherd kind of imagery. It's taking that and doing this whole, uh, it's creating like a really fascinating theology that is really, really uh, important. And uh, it, it, it's super relevant for the time. So we're still staying in the world behind the text. So we're going to go to Revelation 5. Let's not do the King James Version. Let's do the New Living Translation. I'm just picking one. So we have Revelation 5, and we can scroll down. This might be kind of small. I can make it a little bigger. Um, so John begins to weep bitterly, the 42, uh, elders, the lion of the tribe of Judah has won the victory. Okay. So if we click into this verse, we can see all the Greek and then scroll down and then it's all translated. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping on the left-hand side, behold the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David has overcome and that's where that um, has conquered or has victory, okay? And there's a Greek word that it corresponds with, nikao, nikao. We can go from place to place. I'm just taking you on a journey. You don't have to remember how we're getting here. But when we zoom in on one single word, we can actually see where else it shows up in the Bible. 
shows up a little bit in Luke, in John, Romans, 1 John, and then it shows up a bunch of times in Revelation. Okay. So this idea of nikao or victory is something that we're really um, that is really being focused in the book of Revelation, and there's a couple reasons that a lot of scholars think why that is. One of them, um, not one of them, the the reason that many scholars think that we're zooming in on this word nikao is because of goddess named Nike, a Greek goddess named Victory, who then is also a Roman goddess named Victoria. These are figures of worship that appear um, in art. This is a vase from the Roman period uh, of the goddess of Victory. Here's another. And the goddess of Victory is bestowing victory, military victory, to whoever is conquering. Okay, so Revelation is using this word a lot to talk about what the Lamb of God is doing. The Lamb of God is the one often who is conquering. See, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah signifies also the, the conquering, the military success of the tribe of Judah. And when that shows up, it shows up as a lamb. That might be a little bit disappointing, thinking like we needed something with a little bit more teeth than nails. A little something that could actually bring us some victory. But the way that this uh, victory goddess was thought about in uh, this, also this emperor worship time timeline, here's an image that we see a few things here. This is Rome based on um, attributes in this image and others. Here's Rome. Here is Titus being crowned with victory again. Here's Vespasian. These are, the, these are the same characters that we've been sort of seeing. And then do you see here in the back, we have a goddess with wings that's hanging out with Vespasian. And this is the goddess Nike, part of the Roman emperor worship. And really a big part of Roman imperial worship was a huge celebration of victory. Um, Rome was extremely attached to this idea of we go and we conquer, vini vidi vc, right? Uh, we, I go, I saw, I conquered. Um, over here are some other characters. We've got earth and we've got the sea and we've got other stuff. But this is the only the top part of this piece of art. The bottom part is where we see how that system is held in place. We've got peasants, we've got centurions, We've got people that are naked and bound um, and that on the one side, this is the heavenly assembly of imperial worship. And then on the bottom side is the earthly day-to-day -day practices of it. And Romans weren't ashamed of this. They openly made art about this uh, empire practice. So all of these things are coming into play with this lamb. I'd like to read a little bit out of a book that I've cited probably the first week, uh, The Rapture Exposed by Barbara Rossing. Um, she's a professor at the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. She wrote this book in 2003, but she zooms in on this lamb figure as well. Uh, and I'll just read a, a little bit of this, of this book here. It's from chapter six called Lamb Power. In the face of Rome's ideology of victory, the victorious lamb of Revelation looks almost incongruous. In place of overwhelming military strength, we are given the image of a lamb's nonviolent power. In the place of Rome's image of inflicting slaughter on the world, Revelation tells the story of a lamb who has been slaughtered and who still bears the scar of that slaughter. The reversal of these images must have come as a big surprise to first century Christians accustomed as they were to Rome's images of power and victory here. Revelation undertakes to reveal what true power and true victory is. At the heart of the power of the universe stands Jesus, God's slain lamb. So then she talks a bit about the singing and worship being central to Revelation. Um, and then here, 
Seated on the throne of heaven, God holds a scroll sealed shut with seven seals that must be opened. We just read about this. But one who, but who is worthy to open the scroll? God's voice from the throne tells John in chapter five, do not weep for the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Two words in this admonition, the words lion and conquer, which we just learned is Nike in Greek or Nike. This is also where like Nike shoes come from. Nike means victory. And so like, as we're talking like sports, this is sports, this isn't like imperial conquest. But Nike is like, I won my race. And so then they named their brand that. Okay. Um, these two words, lion and conquer, lead us to expect that a fierce animal will appear to open the scroll with its claws like a conquering lion, uh, the lions in gladiatorial spectacles. A lion would be typical for the apocalypse. Such fierce animals are often introduced to advance the plot. There's an apocalypse in 2nd Esdras, for example, where the Messiah is portrayed as a roaring lion, prophesying judgment against the Roman eagle and its violence. Again, we've seen the eagle in a couple places. But Revelation pulls an amazing surprise. In place of the lion that we expect comes a lamb. In Revelation 5, 6, quote, Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb, standing as if it had been slaughtered. This is a complete reversal. Actually, the Greek word that John uses is not just lamb, but little lamb. It's a diminutive form, which can be sort of like a lammy or little lamb, right? So the depiction of Jesus as this lamb shows him in the most vulnerable way possible, as a victim who is slaughtered but standing, that is crucified but risen to life. Um, one, one last piece here. Lamb theology, uh, for Dr. Rossing is what true victory or true Nike is for we too are victors or followers of the lamb on whom the term Nike or conquering is bestowed. And then we see, we'll, we'll take note of who is actually doing this conquering. And it ends up not like the people are just kind of along for the ride. A lot of it is where God is at work in all of this. So, does that address any of the lion of the tribe of Judah question? Are you convinced? It's all clear, thank you. Okay, and if, if you're not convinced, that's okay too. We can it still. It kind of reminds me of uh, last, sometime in the last few years. Remember the Messiah thing? That the Jewish people were expecting a Messiah that was going to be a conqueror rather than a lamb, so to speak. Did we talk about that? Sometime in the past, Pastor Trudy? I don't know. <laughs> but the expectations of Messiah yeah. was to overthrow. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. they wanted. They wanted to be freed of Rome's. Mm -hmm. It just reminds me of the same thing. Yeah. That the Christians, I mean, and they followed Jesus, but they probably liked somebody to overthrow there for sure receiving. wouldn't it be nice right but instead we get a lamb instead we get a lamb a lammy a lammy <laughs> right a little lamb mm -hmm. little. Dotes and dotes. okay so we'll get back into reading here but um has this brought up any if, if this is bringing up some questions um uh, go ahead flag them we can also return to this at next week's session um so we'll start with uh, the first six seals, uh, chapter six, verses one through 17. Then I saw the lamb open one of the seven seals. Chapter six, yeah. I saw the lamb open one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures call out as with a voice of thunder, come. I looked and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow, a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another. And he would, was given a great sword. When I opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come. I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand, 
And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's pay, and three quarts of barley for a day's pay, but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come. I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed with him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence, and by the wild animals of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered for the word of God and for the testimony they had given. They cried out with a loud voice, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge and avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? They were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number would be complete both of their fellow servants and of their brothers and sisters who were soon to be killed as they themselves had been killed. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and there came a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree drops its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll rolling itself up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the magnates and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day, uh, the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Easy. <laughs> so go ahead. So the four creatures are introducing the four horsemen. Right. War, death, pestilence. War, death, pestilence. I can't remember the other one. Plague. Yeah. Plague. Yeah. So again, these uh, these seven seals are sort of heralding and sort of signaling and uh, activating plague stuff. So we start with these seals where it opens up. We'll see in the trumpet section that, again, a lot of this is repeated. And then finally, when the bowls come, it's almost like the seals are opened as the possibility. The trumpets are like, we're going to, it's going to happen. And then the bowls is kind of like, it happens. But all throughout, there's all this like promising of death to a fourth of the world. And we just kind of have to hold that as a part of the great feelings and fears of the Christians of this time period, right? I was thinking about this book earlier and I'm like, there's so much trauma going on <laughs> in this community, right? I, while we were talking about seals, I thought it was interesting that here in the uh, Lutheran study Bible, it specifically talks about what each one is. Okay. Uh, it talks about the first rider attacks and conquers with the message that there is no security in strong national defense. All right. That was the first seal. And then the second one is that uh, the rider cre creates. creates war and rebellion within the people, showing there is no security in the rule of society. Mm. And then the third, uh, showing that there is no security in wealth. Hmm. And the fourth, there is no security in life. All will die someday. And then the fifth, uh, <clears throat> this is a vision of martyrs, those who died because of their Christian faith. It offers a word of hope for those who are oppressed. Mm -hmm. And then the sixth, opening this seal, unleashes a vision of warning and terror that ends with the desperate question of who is worthy to be able to attend in God's presence, mm -hmm. to stand in God's presence. Yeah, when everyone goes into the caves to hide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there is no explanation for number seven. Well, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. We're, um, 
it, these have all come super quick, one after another, right? Like it's all packed into one chapter. And so we've got all of, thank you for that. That's a, um, all of our different Bibles have different resources. There's, um, yeah, it's, it's great to explore. Moving um, from the first six seals, there are seven seals and they've come quick, one after another. And then all of a sudden we have this next section as an interlude. It goes, uh, chapter seven, verse one. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four wing winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on earth or sea or against any tree. I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to damage earth and sea, saying, do not damage the earth or the sea or the trees until we have marked the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. And I heard the numbers of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed out of every tribe of the people of Israel. And as we go into this next section, remember the connections between 12 and perfection, right? So from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. The tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 sealed. That's my tongue twister that I do in the morning when I'm trying to wake up my my face. I'm kidding. That's not. It could be. After this, I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So an elder's like, Quiz time. Who are these? <laughs> uh, for this reason, uh, verse 15. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Pause. So the seven, the six seals have been unleashed and it's just horrifying. And then we have this. Nice, right? We'll just hang out here for a second before we go any farther. <laughs> so what do you notice is similar to um, other parts of the Bible? What do you notice that's also similar to what we do in worship? Is anything connecting here? Can someone say a little bit more about that? And go ahead, raise your hand so that we can um, just have a microphone near you and pick up that sound. What do you notice? What connects? What connects? Besides the song. The songs is one, yeah. Honor I mean, and glory and blessing, thanksgiving and power, Dad? Yes, all of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> mm. 
and I'm looking at this uh, Revelation 7, 15 through 17 section. Uh, like, yeah, I mean, we, we, that's in the Hebrew scripture as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Feels like it. Yeah, Isaiah 49.10 uh, is one thing that's mentioned there in my Bible. And Ezekiel. And also Psalm 23, right? Leading to the river of the water of life. And, you know, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. There's an interesting reversal, too, here, where in the Gospels, Jesus talks about himself as a shepherd. And then he also is like, um, gives some parables about the sheep. Like, if there's one that gets lost, I'll leave the 90, uh, the good shepherd will leave the 99 and go find the one. And in the book of Revelation, it's flipped, whereas there's a lamb in charge and we're all still people. There's still all these humans going around. But there's a lot of reversals that are going on, uh, reversals of expectation of what conquering means, reversals of the shepherd sheep relationship, all kinds of things. That's also kind of the inspiration for why um, I decided to do the rap, the, the book in reverse, um, starting at the end and then going backward because there's, it just plays into all of this reversal connections and it's disjointed enough. I'm like, it, what is it? <laughs> it's confusing enough. So I'm like, well, this is more like a uh, clarification. Okay. Clarification. Than it is of a reversal maybe to say, you oh know, yeah, this is how you interpret it, but it's not right. Sure. Yeah. This is what's right. Yeah, right. That's definitely what it's saying, for sure. Yeah. Well, the big shift is from the beginning of life to the end of six. We were starting with the lion in the six, and with the wrath of the lamb. The wrath of the lamb. No, and we can tell that the lamb can open the seals, like at the beginning of six. It's like, then the lamb did all this, so like, even though you might not expect it to, it's doing it. So. We have one over here with her. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'm always reminded of Mary's, the Magnificat of Mary, mm -hmm. where the powerful have been thrown down and the meek will rise up, will be lifted up. Mm -hmm. It just says a lot to me. Yeah. That's that other reversal. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okie dokie. Let's get into the trumpets, but let's do this. Um, Let's read this stuff uh, at our tables. We can do chapters eight and nine. Let's go chapters eight and nine. So we'll get the first six trumpets and just read them together. Look at annotations at the bottom. See what comes up for your groups. If you have a question or if you want to, you know. Yes, the seventh seal. So uh, verse eight, or chapter eight, verse one. Chapter eight, verse one through chapter nine. Verse 21. Okay. So was there anything that came up for groups that you just are dying to share with the whole group? Um, if there is, go ahead. Let's have some sharing time. And if not, we can go on to the final two chapters for today. Where we ended at the end of chapter 9. Um, whoa. So, thank you. All of a sudden we have some woes, right? There's one way of thinking of woe as like a curse, like woe to this, um, as a thing that's being decided in that moment, right? But going into the, again, I've done a little bit of Greek work before today's session, going into the actual word it's descriptive. It's talking about great grief and anger, um, like a disappointed, like, whoa, sort of thing. Um, in Spanish language translations of the Bible, that is actually um, translated as I. Like, I, I yeah, I. Um, another option that is suggested is like, alas, like just the great grief and lament. So it's more describing what's going on rather than being like, magic hands going, you are cursed. 
right? It's less, it's not so much that I don't think uh, as it is like, whoa, with all of the grief and frustration and anger that comes with the situation that we're in. Um, yes. Other things, we have the, these are the six trumpets and they sound, to me, they have some resonances with the bowls, right? That we had last week with the hail and blood and other things that are going on, right? And were there also some, some similarities between the seals and the bowls? The seals were mostly the horsemen, right? Mm -hmm. But then we have these trumpets that connect to the, um, to the bowl plagues. And the only places that plague is used in the Bible, as far as I'm aware, I could be wrong. Someone stop me if I'm wrong. Um, but plagues are used in Exodus and Revelation. And so there's a direct line between what's going on here in the book of Revelation and what is going on in Exodus. We also earlier had uh, wait until we get to seal or mark all of the people. Again, Passover, like we were marking doors, right? So there's lots of connections between persecution in Egypt under <laughs> Pharaoh and now Rome, uh, but not saying Rome because we're in Rome and we don't want to die necessarily. So let's talk about Babylon, right? These are some of the things that are going on uh, in this text. Trumpets one through four, good and bad and ugly divisions of the world. The bad is destroyed, the bad third. The good is still there, the ugly is unrepenting, and we'll see as we go forward if anything changes about all of those things. Um, The seventh seal is coming, yeah. Or the the seventh seal is the trumpets, and then there's a there's another trumpet coming. There was great silence. There was plenty of silence. Yeah. And then when the yeah. Half an hour, oh. Half an hour silence today. Oh. Sometimes it's actually. I think it's ten and eleven to the last one. Yeah. Okay, let's go through uh, ten and eleven. We've got about eighteen minutes, um, and I think that we can get finished with what we've got today. By the end of next week, you'll have read the whole book of Revelation. You'll go, I don't have any questions anymore. <laughs> Everything makes sense. Um, all right, starting at chapter 10, verse 1. Chapter 10, verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. He held a little scroll open in his hand, setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. He gave a great shout like a lion roaring. And when he shouted, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but... I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, the sea and what is in it. There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is to blow his trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take it and eat. It will be bitter to your stomach, but sweet as honey in your mouth. So I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel, and I ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. Then they said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Have you ever been tempted to eat a scroll? 
Personally, I have not, but this also connects to Ezekiel's scroll in the in the prophet Ezekiel. The Ezekiel also eats a scroll, right? So then we have uh, this interlude in chapters eleven. Chapter eleven, we kind of have a. This is an interlude period, um, as it's labeled in my Bible. Uh, this temple and two witnesses business. So here we go. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, come and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample over the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for 1,260 days wearing sackcloth. To crunch those numbers, 42 months is half of seven years. It's three and a half years. And 1,260 days is 42 months. And it is, so it's just three different ways of saying the same amount of time. Mm, yes, yes. The, the new, not perfect. It's not the seven, it's the opposite. It's the imperfect. Or the negative. Um, just a quick thing. As I was reading this, I was thinking again about the sacking of Rome. Um, and I just like Googled around. I don't know. I went to Wikipedia. And there was a legion from Rome that was stationed in Jerusalem after the year 70 AD. And the the... Um, this legion of Rome was called Legio ex Fredensis. They had their camp in the old city in Jerusalem. And so after they had destroyed the temple, they stayed here. Um, the year lasted about three more years. It ended in 73, uh, or that's the sort of common ending date of the war. So that was just the connection that I don't know how, um, Helpful that is, or accurate that is, but um, something that, as we're talking about this, uh, they will trample over the holy city for 42 months. I was thinking, hmm, there's a holy city, and it's kind of been trampled a little bit recently. So, starting at verse 4, these are the two olive trees. So, pause. We just also finished talking about the two witnesses, right? I will grant two witnesses authority to prophesy for 1,260 days wearing sackcloth. These, as in the two witnesses, are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire pours out of their mouths and consumes their foes. Anyone who wants to harm them must be killed in this manner. They have authority to shut up the sky so that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have authority over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that is prophetically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, members of the peoples and tribes and nations and languages will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and exchange presents because these two prophets had been tormenting, had been a torment to the inhabitants of the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. And those who saw them were terrified. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. At that moment, there was a great earthquake, and one-tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming very soon. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. 
Then the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, singing, We give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, who are and who were, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations, the nations raged, but your wrath has come, and the time for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and all who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and also heavy hail. And then from here, we have a woman and a dragon, we have beasts, we have all of this. Today's readings were a little bit more... We're going through seven things, and then there are seven more things. The first moment that we kind of get pulled out of this seven horrible, horrible, horrifying things rhythm is this temple of two witnesses. And then we have this woman and the dragon. And then later on, we have Babylon and the New Jerusalem, right? That just kind of like jump into this rhythm of seven. Okay, pause. <laughs> How are we doing? So we've seen all of this text. This is essentially all of the vision of John. What we're going to cover next week is John's like beginning of the letter where he is instructed by an angel to write to seven churches. Um, and then the vision begins. And that's where we picked up today, right? So now that you've read through all of the visions and have dwelled in the world of the text and have we've been considering the world behind the text, what kinds of wonderings do you have about interpretations and where we're at today? Okay, I realize this may be opening a bit of a can of worms, but we're really just sort of gathering in, we're in a gathering mode right now. No, no questions will be answered. And honestly, I can't promise anything next week either. But let's just consider a little bit because we're thinking also about how the churches that we're being written to are receiving this. There are seven churches who are getting this letter and they're meeting probably in houses, uh, just sharing with one another. So what kinds of questions come up? I'm grabbing a pen. And it's red, fitting. It's been a lot of <laughs> blood and death and all of that. Yeah, great. Here, are these prophecies great? summarize what's happening in chapter 11 in two or three sentences verses 1 through 14 for next time okay thank you superimpose what's happening today or what might have happened a hundred years ago onto this text. Mm. What do I do with that? Mm. Mm -hmm. Would it be fair to say like it's easy to make this text about what's going on right now? Mm -hmm. Or to interpret? Mm -hmm. Okay. Seven churches do with these letters. Mm-hmm. What did the 
seven churches do with Revelation? Great. What should I do with Revelation? Great. This inspired my faith. I'll need to grow. <laughs> Don't look at me like that, Wendy. Because <laughs> you're so scared to do anything wrong. <laughs> Jewish study tradition there's lots of debate and questions and yeah, it's back and right. forth. So, I mean, I would assume that's what they were doing with this when they got these mm. letters, right? They so, debate and question everything to the nth degree, right? Which is yeah, and they also, understand it any more than we do, right? <laughs> but it's like, what did they do? I'm sure yeah. they're doing this. Sure. Um, and also, though, that this is a, the Christian communities in Asia Minor are pretty diverse, too. So, like, mm -hmm. all of the questions of circumcision are coming up in Galatia um, in order to talk about, like, who is, who can we invite here? <laughs> like, who's welcome? Um, and so there's, there are lots of sort of the Jewish tradition of debating these scriptures. Mm -hmm. And I'm also sure there's quite a few people who are like, what are we talking about? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so good. I, I, all my life, I've heard about the Great Tribulation. Mm -hmm. Is that with all the releasing of the seven trumpets? You know, is that what we're going into? Okay, that's a great question. Was there um, was there debate? And then, what about Great G R eight? Tribulation. Great trip. Mm -hmm. And all that 1,000-year stuff. 1,000-year stuff, yeah. yeah just oh, 1,000. You really want to get into it. Is that pre or post Armageddon? Pre or post Armageddon, yep. I think Wendy, uh, Wendy. I, Trudy, <laughs> Trudy, man. That's the truth. I, mean, true. I think she ought to preach on that. For sure. I think Vicar should do it. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Go ahead. Good <laughs> luck. <laughs> Isaiah next weekend, so You're stay tuned. Up. You're stay booked tuned. up. <laughs> <laughs> book too. Right, for the intern to have to do that. I think it's part of the intern. Exactly. <laughs> to to yes. preach on Revelation. Yeah. Yes. Because on the intern job, just yes. <laughs> what did I sign up for? <laughs> All right, Any, anything else? We've got just a couple minutes, but we can end in prayer, unless there's anything that you're still, yeah. I had a little chat with you last week. You mentioned that uh, when they were trying to figure out what books to put in the Bible, that yeah. they were talking about not putting this in. Right. Is there, was there a reason for that? Debate. What their reason was for not putting it in? Or what's the reason it got in? Yeah. 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 So I just jotted down debate about canon, how it was included in the yeah. biblical canon, right? Because that's when every all the books came together and we had one uh, agreement. So yeah, I'll bring that up. Okay. Good stuff. Cool. 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 I'm just curious, can I do an informal poll? Can you raise your hand if you've read any of the Left Behind novels? A couple, a few of you. What about um, How Lindsay's The Late Great Planet Earth? Okay, a few. Okay, cool. Do you want any, like, touching on any of those things? Are you curious about? I think clarifying them would be good and being helpful. Okay. Because they tend to get donated to churches. Yep, they do. <laughs> um, and then we tend to Somewhere else. Yeah. So. Like, we'll just leave it there. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you
Yeah. All right. I read the All right. I just want to say thank you all again for being here. Um, this has been a great joy for me being able to lead this Bible study. We have one more, um, and then all of our questions will be answered, and we'll have no more questions about the Book of Revelation. So. I have one request that I want yeah. people to bring their ideas because we're going to do something similar again. We do another little education thing in the season of Epiphany in January, February. So if there are particular topics that you really like, if you could just jot them down and we'll kind of ask for those next week and we'll start preparing for that because this has been so much fun. You keep coming back. Mm -hmm. We want to share some things that might be interesting to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's pray. Mm, almighty and merciful God, thank you so much for your presence here with us today as we've chewed on a lot of really meaty imagery and confusing imagery um, and some real words of rejoicing and glory and honor and power to you, Lord. Um, be with us as we continue to make sense for ourselves of what this book means in our lives and be with us as we go out of this place as well into the rest of our weeks. In the name of Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. Amen. Then the Lamb. And the Lamb. Little Lammy. <laughs>